to 23 and uh, verse number 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse number 9. Moreover, Jehoiada and the priests delivered to the captains of hundreds spears and bucklers and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he said, All the people, every man having his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, along by the altar and the temple, by the king round about. Then they brought out the king's son and put upon him the crown and gave him the testimony and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, God save the king. In the ninth verse, moreover, he brought out and delivered to the captains the spears, the bucklers, and the shields that had been King David's which were in the house of the Lord. If the Lord will help me tonight and you'll pray for me, we're going to preach to you on a message that we have entitled, David's Old Weapons. Father, thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. I thank you, God, that we stand here partly because of the kind invitation of this pastor and congregation. But more so, oh God, we stand here tonight because we are a debtor. Woe be unto us if we preach not the gospel. Therefore, we deplore, God, uh, uh, not our inabilities nor insufficiency before thee. But we ask simply, God, that you would anoint us with that anointing that takes a man and makes him a prophet in the sense of the New Testament. Let the canopy of your glory settle around this tabernacle tonight. Rebuke the spirit of diversion. Lay hold, O God, on every heart tonight. God, challenge us and make us to know that it's not much longer to be ready. Father, at the conclusion of the message tonight, uh, give us victory on the altars. uh, And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen. If you're a Bible scholar, briefly, you already know the history behind uh, our text tonight. Ethlaniah, the daughter of Jezebel, has risen to power by the same hellish spirit that abided in her mother as she dominated Israel. You know how that uh, when her son was killed, that she quickly uh, sought to destroy all the royal seed of the king and would have done so had not uh, one little boy been spirited away and hid in the temple. You know, I like uh, the the way that God operates. Uh, At this particular point uh, in history, all of the prophetic promises concerning the royal seed and the lineage that would come down was hinging upon one little baby. God is so sure of Himself that He let it came down to this one little baby. But for nigh on to seven years, this uh, uh, hellish woman uh, rules as queen uh, over all the people of God in Judea. While she was doing that, while she was spreading her venom, while she was uh, casting her spell, while she was uh, degrading and bringing down the people of God, uh, yonder hid away in the recesses of the temple, this old priest was grooming a baby boy. He was raising him up, uh, steeping him in the tradition of of holiness and of righteousness and of godliness uh, uh, teaching him the old ways of uh, uh, the ways of Jehovah God and preparing him for a day and finally the day comes when he sends out uh, uh, his uh, uh, emissaries all through the land to bring back the Levite uh, to bring back the priest uh, to bring those who once were the worship of Jehovah he brings them into the sanctuary he presents to him to them he his plan. He says, uh, we, are, we have here this royal seed. We have this king's son here. And it's our uh, plan to overthrow this wicked woman uh, and to take again the kingdom for God. And I can hear them as saying, uh, uh, we're mighty tired of this uh, uh, spirit of Jezebel. We're mighty tired of what's been going on around here. But oh, she's powerful. And she's mighty. And she has many friends. Uh, how are we going to 
to do it. What are we going to do? And this old priest says, I was contemplating that and walking through the temple. I want you to come here. I want to show you something. There's an inner sanctuary here. There is a armory hidden right here. And hanging on the walls of this armory are weapons of warfare that have been hung there through the years. David hung his weapons there. David's mighty men hung their weapons there. It is the hall of fame, if you will. And from that hall of fame, I intend to take down the weapons and to win back the kingdom of God. Oh, are you going to help me preach tonight? You see, this spirit of Jezebel would have never come to power had Jehoshaphat, the good king, never went down and joined affinity with Ahab. I do not wish to fly against the grain. Uh, maybe I do. Uh, one man told me one time, he said, I was telling him, you know, about to, not to following the crowd at school. And he said, but yeah, it's always been easy for you. And probably it was. I always went right when the crowd went left. This was the joy of going that way. They invited me into the fellowship. I said, I'm so independent. I can't get along with independence. So maybe I am. But I'm telling you this tonight. Uh, hey man, uh, help me Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I don't want to fly against uh, uh, the trend tonight. Uh, but I want you to know something. I can't fellowship everything. My young people can't fellowship everything. Everything ain't a going. Hey man, you might be able to handle that worldly bunch. Uh, you might be able to rub elbows with them. But if you're not careful while you're uh, rubbing Abraham uh, 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 back and pat him on the back your boy will be playing with his girl and when it comes time to get married all of a sudden she ain't interested in the wholeness girls he ain't interested in all them wholeness girls he thinks about that little one that flipped and tripped and painted and dooted up and he goes back down there and joins up with that and that's the consequences of ungodly alliances that has brought us to this place tonight that we see them here the consequences of ungodly adjoining and ungodly fellowship Bless God, you can have every singing group you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. If you don't live right and spit wide, you ain't singing in my pulpit. I don't need the handsomes or the handsomes or anybody else. Give me somebody. I'd better have one old grandma that would sing in a cracked voice. Where is my wandering boy tonight? Amen. That have all and have the anointing of the Holy Ghost on her. That all the count in all the world. God, I don't need some homosexual rearranging my music uh, so that we can sing it. Uh, we're not here to wow you. We're here to, uh, to impress you or bless you. We're here to help you tonight. And I'm telling you that there's a time we need to raise up in the hour we're living in. Uh, we're putting a long train tonight. But I'm going to tell you, I come to preach to you. I settled this before 8 o'clock this morning. That this was the will of God for tonight. Hey Amen. And if you'll help me, it'll be better. If you don't help me, it'll take me longer. But I will get through a preaching. If you want to sit on it, dig in good and deep. Lock it up good and tight and we'll just burn it out. As long as we go along the way. But I feel like telling me and you tonight that there is in the hour we're living in this same hellish spirit. This same hoary spirit. This same Jezebel spirit. Hey Amen. That is seeking to come over our people. With a spirit of fear. Oh God. When the time come. And a man of God got concerned about it. I'm glad that David. Had enough foresight. And enough of God about him to realize that when he won the battle, he said, Hey, I'm going to take this weapon and I'm going to put it in the house of God. Because there'll be another generation come along after a while and they'll have their same battles to fight. They'll be in the same war and they'll need the same help. And therefore, I'm going to lay up these weapons. If you'd have walked through there with them, you'd have seen... David's sling. You'd have seen Goliath's sword. You'd have seen the spear with which the young and mighty man stood in the middle of the field and slew 300 of the enemy. 
You'd see some odd things there in the midst of the swords, the bucklers, and the shields. I believe you might see an old wrinkled up piece of bone up there. And a close examination, you would find it the jawbone of an ass. You'd see an ox gourd there. Nothing but a sh- more than a sharpened stick. But one day a man said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I've run the last time. And in the midst of a pea patch, he had a wrestling match. And God wrought deliverance. Amen. I want you to realize tonight that we are in a warfare. We are in a battle. We are besieged by the very hordes of hell. But I want you to know also that even as bad as it looks, we are not defenseless. For the Bible said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm hearing all the time. Brother Gabbard, you just don't understand. You don't understand the world we're living in. You don't understand the the filth and the degradation that we put up with every day. You don't understand what it's like. I understand that Jezebel, that spirit of Thyatira who has come among us, who has taught our people to be harnessed, who has prostituted the guilt. I understand that she's among us. But I also understand that if you're six, 16 or 60, if you're Holy Ghost filled and far baptized, there is a weapon of warfare that will keep you in the middle of the hour we're living in. Amen. I want to preach to you tonight about it's time that we as a church went back into the temple of God and took down some of the old weapons that have been hanging there for a while. I want to say to you young man, I want to say to you young woman, you can take the weapon your daddy used and your granddaddy used and it's just as deadly. It may not be stylish, but it's still deadly. One man told me a few some time ago, he said, I preached one of your messages. I said, man, they ain't mine. I don't have any patent on them. How about it? I got it from the same book you're preaching out of. Go to it. He said, you know what? They shouted you down that night. You preached it. He said, that's about enough to hang me. You see, it ain't. It ain't the message. Sometimes, but sometimes it's the anointing. Hey, Amen. Oh, i got to slow down and hurry at the same time. I want you to know that at a time of great testing, sometime this morning I began to let my mind run back over the years that I'd been, I'd been here before and this man that uh, had become such a, a wonderful friend of mine. Oh, I told him, Brother Collins, I, I said, me and that red-headed fellow, don't always, he used to be red-headed, don't always disagree. We don't always agree, but we're friends. Ah, we're friends, the bond of love there. But you see, I, I was thinking about these old weapons, Sister Collins, and I remembered when the, the pressure was on, when the world and this had come in like a flood around me, when I was surrounded on every side, when the deacon board wanted worldliness, or when the people wanted worldliness, when the youth leader wanted worldliness, when they said it's either crumble in and capitulate to what we're saying or you're going to have to pack your bags and get out of here and go. I remember laying down one night in my bed troubled not knowing what to do. The battle raging. I heard a horn blowing outside. I got up and opened the door and a man said, I just come from Germantown, Ohio. And I just come from some kind of a meeting. A convention might have been in your church, Tim. I don't remember. He said some kind of convention meeting. He said Brother L. L. Collins was a preaching tonight and he said, I got the tape and brought it to you. He said, because I feel like you need to hear this. I walked him there and laid back down in the bed, put it in the tape player. I, I didn't know Ella Collins uh, except by name and some by reputation. But I began to listen to a message. Uh, he began to read that night, uh, and his, the title of his message was uh, Don't Change Because God Don't. Uh, I listened a while and got out of the bed. Uh, I shouted a while and praised God. Uh, I realized, uh, well, hey, God, you are talking to me. Uh, you're telling me to take down the old weapons. Uh, I may not be as stylish as they are, I may not be as pretty as they are, but it'll work. Uh, and I went back and I'm where I am now because I took the old sword and the old shield and stood the test. Come on. Yeah. 
hey, 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 we need to move a God. And the only way we're going to get it is getting like Daddy got it. Oh, God. I cannot figure out why that we have this infatuation with this Jezebel ministry. I cannot figure out why we are wanting to patternize our ministries after men who know about God but who do not know God. We have the airways full of the teaching seminars and they, we, we are flocking to them with pitiful loyalty and they can tell us about God but they don't know who God is. Hey Amen. What I want to know tonight is like the little old woman that came to the man to be prayed for and she's going to teach her, I don't want to know from you, buddy. Have you got it or have you not? Bottom line is, have we got it or have we not? Every movement... It's had its Hall of Fame. And too many times, for too many of them, it's turned into a Hall of Shame. In this hour we're living in, how many, how many that I knew? Oh, God, help me tonight. God being my helper, my message hasn't changed since the last time I preached for you. If anything, I believe closer than I ever have in my life. I've read the book and looked for the loopholes. And I still see, only thing I see, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without that purity of life, I don't see any way of shortchanging it. I don't see any way of getting around it. And oh, my friend, but since I have been in this ministry, there's been men that we've sung with and shouted with that said, if you ever get in trouble, just call me, I'll come to you. That tonight, they're somewhere else. They're doing something else. There's preachers and pastors that once I preached with, we went to the house of God together. We took sweet counsel together, shouted together, and now they're off in some other way. And there's too many among us, amen, that has left the hall of fame be Become a hall of shame because they have hung up the breastplate of righteousness and they no longer believe in a holy life, in a separated life, in a different look. They no longer wear that breastplate. They've hung it up yonder. But if there were a time, my friend, when wholeness people ought to look different from the world, it's in the hour that me and you are living in. Hung up the breastplate. Therefore, they no longer believe in holiness. Others have taken their shield of faith, laid them up as if they had never been anointed. And now they live in unbelief. No longer is there healing of the sick among them, nor do they believe in miracles. And yes, there are even those who no longer hold the sword of truth. It breaks my heart. But I've looked at men that are close to me. Men that were my heroes when I come here, Brother Collins. Men that I, I, I made heroes out of because of I've seen them in their lives. And now they've grown old. And they look at me and say, well, it didn't mean it. That really wasn't the way it was. That wasn't what it was. Brother Collins, when you told me don't change because God don't change. And you preached after hour after hour and example after example. I believe that. And what I am doing tonight is simply believing what you told me then. If it sounds like I'm coming out of left field, all I'm doing is preaching the same kind of wholeness that the old men of God used to preach. The same brand. You say we're in a new age. We have the same devil we've always had. He may have a new guise, but the same same gun that brought him down then will bring him down now. The same slingshot will bring him down. The same sword will defeat him. But they've hung their sword of truth up and now they are believing a lie and they are damned. Tell me you used to believe it but you don't believe it now. When did you lie? Which time was you wrong? If you're wrong then you may be wrong now. You're untrustworthy. I'm preaching about if we're going to crown the king in our generation. You see, David laid these, oh, glory to God. David laid these weapons up because he knew that every generation would have to fight its own battles. I may lose you, but I may, I may never had you. But since I'm not a politician, it doesn't matter. Since I'm not a promoter, it doesn't matter. 
But you know what? In our desire to protect our children, we have given them a bottle when what they needed was the battle. Amen. We have gilded them. I'm glad, Brother Jim, that when I sent that group of worldly young people to Barberville Youth Camp that year, that you didn't coddle them, that they thought you were one of the meanest people I'd ever seen. But you probably don't even remember it, but one of my boys got a conviction so bad, he decided he wanted a haircut, and you gave it to him. But it started us on the road. But what bothers me is the thing that brought that glorious revival in those days. All of a sudden, we're looking to try some new fangled thing. Why in the world are we caught up and infatuated with Saul's armor, which is unproven, and when it's been proven, it's been pierced on every side? What I can understand is why we're caught up with that and why we won't go back and say it worked yesterday, it worked to the last revival, it worked when we got in trouble the last time. Let us go back into the temple, get the same thing they got there, get the weapon of prayer, the weapon of dedication, the spear of dedication, amen, of separation, and do what we did then. Do it again! Hey man, young people, you must fight your own battle in your day. But we've tried to lay it up for you. I've tried to point the way to you. I told my young people if I could, I'd run interference for you. Yes, sir, I would. I'd get in front of you. I'd take the enemy out one by one. But sometimes we've got to step back. A lot of people say, where, where you had Brent Gabbard hid? Been hid in bond. And I'll tell you why he's been hid there. Because I am not... I am not anxious for him to step out there in an untried place with an untried weapon and sell off on somebody else's name and somebody else's reputation. Because I'm going to tell you something, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, it doesn't matter how talented you are, We've got a bunch of people like that around us today. We've got the sanest people we've ever had among us. The guitar playing is people, the piano play. We've got the more talent than the church has ever had. But it looks like if something don't happen, it ain't going to amount to anything because it's not going to be used of God until it is blessed of God. And it's not going to be blessed of God until it's broken by God. Until you have allowed God to break your stubborn will, break your worldly spirit, break your own desire. Until you say, any way you fix it, Lord, it's all right with me. Until you sing for the glory of God. Amen. It don't matter if it's the right key or not. If you're anointed, you'll sing when your voice cracks. You'll sing when you get hoarse. You'll scream and preach like I am tonight when nobody ain't listening. Oh, God. Many, many are infatuated the church. I want to tell you, I feel like we've been under Jezebel's rule long enough. I think it's time that you reach up on the wall and take down the old weapons and put them where they they really need to be. In the hand of a man and on the arm of a warrior who says, I'll serve or I'll die. And it don't make me no difference. But this is the way it's going to be. I want to fight until this generation crowns him king. I thank God for what that generation did. I thank God for what happened yesterday. I thank God for holding this heritage. But what I'm interested right now is that this generation comes up. Amen. Fight the same battles we fought until they settle in their heart. Young people, I have preached now for for about six or eight months to my people. If you don't get it in your heart, if the only reason you don't cut your hair is because we had to stand against it, if the only reason you don't dress a certain way is because we stand against it, it ain't going to be good enough. You need to pray it through until you get it in your heart and say, I live this way because it's the Bible way. I live this way because it's the holiness way. It's the only way. And when you get it in your heart, you'll find out the same weapon that worked in that generation will work for you. It may not be stylish. But I want you to know, during, I read an account years ago of one of the battles fought in the Civil War, or in the Revolutionary War, rather. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The English were trained, and they were very gallant, brave soldiers. But when they came over here, they was fighting 
for an ideal. We're a fighting for our children. That's why that I read the account of a battle that was pitched. That old ragtag bunch of uh, revolutionaries hid away back there in that thicket across the field. With all they had was their flintlock rifles and, and, and uh, primitive weapons. And on the other side was the fife and drum and the royal regiments. And they began to make their march across the field to annihilate this little ragtag bunch. But the account that I read was given by one of those Englishmen that marched. And he said, as we begin to march across the open field towards the enemy, to engage the enemy, over there, by a big old rock fence, beside of a tree, a puff of smoke came. And one of our men fell. He said, in a few moments, said, we'd been, we'd been catching fire from all along the line, but their primitive weapons were not able to reach us. But you see, in the middle of those men was one old coonskin capped, deer skin clad mountain man with a Kentucky rifle. And every time he fired, the enemy fell. Said so after a while nobody was shooting but him. And said so he stepped out and leaned on the side of that tree. And said so with great pomp and ceremony he'd load that old rifle. He'd lick his thumb and touch the sight. And he said every time he brought it up and fired, we'd see a puff of smoke and somebody would fall. And he said, after a while, that end of that gun barrel got as big as a cannon. And he said, brave men begin to dread the crack of the rifle. Because every time he fired, an enemy fell. Until halfway across that field, hardened troops turned and run because one man with a squirrel rifle was a shooting. I was in McKaysville, Georgia, in a little holiness church. I had been preaching holiness, trying my best. Jimmy Swaggart had just made his famous statement that every old barn looked a little better with some paint on it. I was in that place praying in that little church on the altars. I was telling God, Lord, I'm just one little old country preacher. I'm down here away from my wife and my family. I'm preaching among these strangers. And I'm, and I'm not getting much of a response. And how can I hope to make any, have any influence when men with multi-million dollar ministries are making fun of and making light of the things that brought me to the way of holiness? It was there at that altar that day that the Holy Ghost came upon me and spoke to me. And he said, I'm going to shake the heavens and the stars are going to fall. It was in that meeting, several, several months, uh, years maybe, but before that anybody knew anything, that God spoke to me and said, Jimmy Swaggart is coming down. I told that congregation, I didn't get the right kind of a response. I told one of the preacher and the Lord said, shut up. But that preacher told his father-in-law, who happened to be Charles Barnett, and Charles Barnett told his congregation, and he told it that was next year at uh, uh, the Bristol meeting. He said a lot of folks seen it after it happened. He said, but one man saw it then. I'm telling you that to say to what the Lord was telling me. All you got, son, is a squirrel rifle. If all you've got is one old flintlock rifle, it may be out of style. They may tell you this old time preaching's out of style. They may tell you you've got to get a hold of something else. But I'm telling you to walk back into the temple of God and take down David's old sling and get that jawbone. We throw it away way too quick. There's still some good things in it. And take the old weapons and fight the battle again. And with the same weapons that David won the victory and brought down the giant. With the same weapons. He called us at the rim of the Great God in heaven. With the same weapons that's kept us all these years. He'll put you in the hall of fame. And if you don't, you'll be in the hall of shame. Oh God, i got to hurry. I'm telling you, folks... There's a spirit of revival at the highway of holiness. But it will fuzzle out, it'll fizzle out and die like the rest of them have, except it's founded on these young folks getting a hold of a vision. They'll think of you no different than they do any other wild, fanatical bunch until they see you. 
my kids still go to public schools. One of the highest compliments that I've been paid was by one of them, a teacher that I have known all my life that I am convinced is an atheist. And he called me and he said, Preacher, I want to say this. Let me just help say it. He said, Now we've got born again all over our classrooms. He said, But when a bond holding this young puppy comes into my class, before anybody says anything, I can tell it. I can tell it. You know, it's amazing. We can go around to Tennessee. We can go down to the outlet stores at Pigeon Forge. We can walk down through all that nakedness. And ever so often, somebody will walk up to us and they'll say, you folks are holding this on you. Some folks will walk up to my wife. It's amazing to me. These women will walk up with their hair about that long. And I don't know what they've done to it, how many times they've done it to it. And they'll look at her hair, you know, uh, that gray hair that's, got, that's been there because she's tried to help pastor a church. Uh, and they'll look at her and say, I love your hair. As if they've never seen anything like it. You know what we need? The world needs to see a difference. Oh, I know. That's a, I'm just about ready to puke on that. It's a thing of the heart. It sure is. Yes, sir. Wholeness is a thing of the heart. But if you get the right kind of wholeness in your heart, young man, young lady, it'll be like the grease we used to put in the gourd. That kind in the hills. The only way we had you, hog, hog renderings. We put them in gourds and kept it. And after a while, the grease on the inside would melt and run to the outside. And that old gourd would be greasy on the outside. I'm here to tell you tonight if you get it just right on the inside it'll run to the outside. David come a running to the priest. He said, I'm running. He said, is there any weapons here? And he said, we ain't got any weapons. He said, wait. He said, we got Goliath's sword here. He said, bring it here. Give me Goliath's sword for there's none like it in the land. And he unwrapped that sword and he put it by his side. Amen. Oh, it looks like it's unpopular. But I'm telling you, if we will take the weapon of the word, it is still written. And God still means what he says. And he don't need somebody with a, several letters up behind their name to get up and tell you. One young lady got amongst us from the world, the worldly bunch, the wild bunch. And she fell in love with holiness. And you know, it never occurred to her to doubt the Word of God. I'm so glad that in that barn at Farmersville, I read that book through from cover to cover before I met some of these unbelieving preachers who told me God still didn't work miracles among His people. I'm so glad I'd already read it, already practiced it, and already been worked before they got me. But this young lady began to... There was a situation that was impossible. Absolutely impossible. It could not be done. It was impossible. There was no way to get from this side of the city to that side of the city in time, through the traffic jam in time to meet that destination and the preacher wasn't going to get there. She said, let's pray. And the preacher began to tell this young convert how that there's no... And she said, now, wait a minute, with all due respect, sir. And she began telling him where she come from. And she said, I don't want you to tell me what he can't do. So tell me what he is doing. And he said, I can't explain it to you. But I let a little girl pray. And I cried like a baby and said, God, give me back what I've lost. And she, she said, I don't know how to tell you about it. He said, we took a turn here and a turn there. He said, but we got to the other side of the city. And she said, see, there's nothing my God can't do. You know what we need to tell these young folks? We need to tell them to launch out and believe God. You ain't cracked the surface of what God can do yet. There's still miracle power in the name of Jesus. God still turns it around for those. The weapon of prayer still works. Right before Christmas, Charlie Gray, well, Stevie Gray's daddy, retired, just retired from president of the phone companies, and my secretary and treasurer, we buried his wife, who had been my secretary and my treasurer for 23 years. In 23 years of being my treasurer, she never had ever had one argument with her. She never did get to feel like that money belonged to her. I never had to explain to her why she's writing checks for her. And she was always our saying, Pastor, tonight's the night for this. Pastor's the night's the night for that. 
She came to get prayed for on a Wednesday night. She stood right there. I laid my hand on her. She just had a flu. Laid my hand on her and prayed. And turned to walk away and look back, and she wasn't there anymore. She's gone. Riding home that night, I told my wife, I said, Edna, it's gone from this world. Sunday morning, she was still so sick. She was so sick, she couldn't hardly walk, but she walked and wobbled into the house of God. Sunday evening, God gave me a funeral message. And Monday night, she was in eternity. Now, Charlie goes to his doctor for his annual checkup, and they tell him the same heart problem that kills your daddy is yours. We must have an instant surgery. We must get in there now. That, that valve is deteriorated. It's gone. We've got to do something now. He looked at him and he said, It's Christmas. I'm going home. I'll be back when the holidays are over. But I'm going home and take Christmas with my grandbabies. He's a very, very reserved man. Very reserved. Very, very quiet. But one night... He didn't, he didn't even tell the kids after the holidays was over. And he told Stevie. One night he came up and told me, he said, I'm going back for the, the checkup and they want to do surgery. He said, I want to get prayed for. Unassuming. We didn't tear the house down. He just stood there. We anointed him, laid hands on him. And the Spirit of God just does what it does sometimes among homeless people. Let me tell you something. We're pitiful without Him. But we're the only people that He ever comes back and visits. You may try us a time or two and nothing may happen. We may anoint you and pray for you and nothing may happen. We may be like them fellas was at the foot of the mountain while He's gone away yonder. But if you'll stay around a while, oh glory to God, we're the people He comes back to. And He came by that night and we prayed. And He went on down there and Stevie went with Him. He went in there and that battery of doctors came in again. They run their test again. they have done all those things again. He said, I I was sitting over here, I, I laying over here on that thing that had me in there, and he said, I kept hearing them talking. He said, they'd send and get another, and he'd come in. After a while, there's about seven of them over there, just talking it over. He said, I started to get worried, and I said, no, I ain't worried, they are. Mm. And after, after about seven of them looked it all over, they came back in and said, well, Mr. Gray, we don't know what's happened. Uh, here it is uh, in December, and here it is in February. I'll tell you what happened. The weapon of prayer still works. Uh, amen. There are still people that can get out somewhere and pray it all the way through to the glory world. It still works. Don't give up on it. If it don't happen, come back again. Try it again. Try it again. Hang on. Oh, God. Oh, for that spear of dedication to duty. The shield of separation. Oh, church, my call tonight is let us come to the hall of fame. Take down the weapons. One more story we're going to pray. World War II. The order came down to the captain. There's only one way through that little opening right there. Behind that opening is the machine gun nest of the enemy. We cannot advance. A whole, a whole regiment has been held back. Somebody has got to go through. It'll probably be certain death, but somebody's got to go through and open up a way. Pick a man. He called all his men. His men that had fought with him all across the east. He walked down to each one of them. At one time or another, he'd seen each one of them in the face of fear and danger. He tried to decide, who am I going to send? By the time he got to the end of the line, he realized, I can't send any of them. And so without another word, he dropped his pack, his rations. He drew his gun. And he turned. And he ran through the brake. And he ran so deep into the territory that he was shot to doll rags before he got started. But he ran a hundred yards dead. And he fell. The men stood there in stunned silence for a little while. And then one of them looked at the other. And says, how our captain died in vain. And they said, we'll take the hill or we'll die beside of him. 
And as one man, they threw away everything but their shell belts and their weapons. They wasn't worried about it. They knew if they won, they'd win. And if they didn't, they didn't need other stuff anyway. They threw away their medical packs. They threw away their radios. And all they took was their guns and ammunition. And as one man, they charged the brake. And they went through that machine gun nest and took out that whole regiment. And the war went on. And the call was, has our captain died in vain? And my last word to you as we make an altar call tonight. Has the great and mighty captain of our salvation died in vain? Has the great men of God who fought yesterday's battles fought it for nothing? Will we throw down the truth that they died for as if it was nothing? I think not. I think not. Holy I don't know about you, but I draw a line here. They called me a little while back, and the pressure was on. I mean, the pressure was on. They began to tell me about some things. And I said, Mister, there's one thing you don't understand. This ain't just something I'm a preaching. This ain't just some a, a preference I've got. If you cut me, I bleed right here. I don't want you as my enemy. But if this is what you're asking me to compromise on, here I stand and I can do no less. Too many miles behind me. Too many great men's done given, lived and died for it. Too many mamas have prayed over it. The captain of my salvation went this way. I see his tracks and I'm following him. And so live, die, sink, or swim. The die is cast. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I preach to you tonight, I challenge you to come back to the old path, to stand in the ways and see what a good boy is, to walk therein. I challenge you to take off the wall. They just hung there too long. Take your heart back off the wheel. Take your gun down and do what you can for God. For one can touch a thousand and two can turn ten thousand. And what can we do if we get together and go for God in the hour we're living in? And I'm challenging you tonight. Come, take the old weapons and see whether they work or not. I challenge you not to live but die for glory. Let's stand tonight and open the altars. David's old weapons. Has the captain died in vain? Will you come? Brother Pastor. Too many sunsets lie behind the mountain. Too the hour of decision. My feet have the valley of decision. Too many treasures. We can't go back. We must go on. With a made up mind. To a commitment without compromise. Too many sunsets. Behind the mountain, we choose too many rivers. We choose the right and the holy path. We choose the treasures away. We choose the good way. There's too much. When so many are making the wrong choice, we choose the right way. Come on. Call on the name of the Lord this night. Me. Call on God this day. Too many trials are through. Come Too through. many tears help me to remember. There's too much to gain. Somebody to go through. Too many rivers. 
my feet have walked through Too many treasures are waiting over yonder There's too much to gain to lose I've crossed the heart-burning desert 